Uh, good evening and thank you for joining this presentation on the Union mobilizing for war in the early days in the East, which will be a story of individual initiative and improvisation. Friday, April 12th, the uh, Confederacy fires on Fort Sumster, which surrenders the next day on April 13th. After a Consulting with his cabinet on Sunday, April 14th, Lincoln issues a proclamation calling for 75,000 state militiamen uh, to uh, serve on behalf of the U.S. for 90 days to uh, help uh, reclaim uh, property that had been taken from the national government. Uh, the next day, Washington, D.C. Uh, was still in the center of the United States as Richmond in, uh, in Virginia had not yet seceded. Um, <clears throat> they had called earlier after the first wave of states had seceded. Um, a, a secession convention which had voted uh, pretty strongly against uh, secession. However, of course, Virginia was a slave-owning southern state. Maryland was a slave-owning uh, essentially southern state. And Washington was sandwiched between Richmond to the south and Baltimore to the north, both strong pro-Southern states. And Washington itself was a Southern state with a lot of federal employees and residents who um, had strong pro-South um, uh, leanings. Well, on April 16th, the former governor of Virginia, Henry Wise, um, called uh, for some militiamen uh, to meet him in Richmond, and then sent them off to Harper's Ferry and Gosport, promising them that the next day he would have the uh, secession convention vote to secede. And it did, it did in a secret session. Um, Washington uh, was unaware of this on the 17th. The next day, the 18th, Turner Ashby, who's the uh, vice president of the Virginia militia, and uh, hundreds of militiamen overrun the handful of U.S. troops at Harper's Ferry who do their best to destroy what they can um, before uh, retreating into Maryland. However, uh, they, uh, Ashby uh, collects uh, uh, thousands of rifles and uh, more importantly, equipment for making uh, muskets that will be shipped to Richmond and uh, be used by the South throughout the war. Uh, more and more men continue to gather at Harper's Ferry, uh, through which the B&O Railroad runs, which is uh, one of the three rail links that connect Washington, D.C. to the north. The next day, April 19, um, a mob in um, Baltimore riots. Um, one regiment uh, is able to get through two other regiments uh, are turned back. There are deaths in all three regiments, uh, as well as a lot of civilian deaths. Um, immediately afterwards, um, Isaac Trimble takes the uh, Maryland militia north along the north central line toward Harrisburg and burns uh, a key bridge at Cockeysville. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, chief of police of Baltimore takes a handful of uh, of men uh, northeast along the Pennsylvania, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad to burn bridges uh, connecting that railroad um, to, uh, uh, between Baltimore and Philadelphia. So uh, Washington, D.C. is now cut off from uh, the, the north by rail. The day after that, on Saturday, April 20th, uh, militiamen under the command of William Tolliver uh, uh, overrun Gosport Navy Yard. Uh, attempts were made to uh, destroy uh, what they could um, uh, before the Union men left. However, uh, those attempts largely failed and uh, tens of thousands of pounds of gunpowder were seized as well as thousands of heavy cannon. As a result, it was believed that uh, the Potomac River was blocked um, to traffic and possibly 
um, since it was not known whether or not any of the uh, Navy warships were captured at Gosport, Chesapeake Bay may also be closed to the Union. So uh, at the end of the day, on April the 20th, this is the situation that Washington, D.C. found itself in. To quickly summarize uh, what Washington was facing and what the North was facing in terms of mobilizing compared to the Confederacy, uh, the South had largely started to mobilize after John Brown's raid in 1859. Uh, in 1860, the Secretary of War, John Floyd, um, who was a, another ex-governor of Virginia, uh, <clears throat> started to send uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, armaments from uh, Harper's Ferry, um, Springfield, and other arsenals in the north to arsenals in the south. And of course, as the uh, seven deep uh, south states seceded, they successfully seized um, all the uh, federal uh, armories um, located in the south. In February, the, uh, the uh, seven states created the uh, Confederacy created a, a provisional federal uh, Confederate government, complete with a provisional Confederate army that was authorized to have 100,000 men. Then of course, um, all of the, uh, the uh, weapons, gunpowder, uh, and cannons seized at Harper's Ferry and Gosport immediately after Virginia seceded. Uh, these are, this is a list of arsenals in the South seized by uh, the Confederates uh, prior to uh, Virginia seceding, including the arsenal in Little Rock, Arkansas, which had not yet uh, uh, seceded itself. So what about the U.S. Army compared to uh, what the, uh, the South was creating with its state militias and, and the like? It had a total of 197 combat companies formed into 19 regiments. Half were infantry regiments, a quarter were uh, mounted regiments, and uh, the, the remaining were uh, four artillery regiments. Over 90% of these companies were stationed in the six Western departments. And it's important to note that at this time, companies were not uh, uh, listed at 100, uh, 100 men. Frequently, they had only 40 to 45 men. In the East, only 18 artillery companies were stationed, uh, scattered around at various uh, forts. This is a map of the organization of the uh, U.S. Army at the time of 1860-1861. Uh, you had a, 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 the Department of the East, which is where the, the vast majority of the fighting is going to be held during the war, uh, headquartered in Troy, New York. Um, you had a Department of the West headquartered in St. Louis with the largest uh, uh, army installation in the country at Jefferson Barracks, primarily because this serves as the jumping off point for the uh, other five departments west of the Mississippi. Of particular note is the Department of Texas uh, with its headquarters in San Antonio. Um, about one fifth of the uh, entire US Army was stationed in the Department of Texas. Um, uh, guarding uh, the frontiers against uh, uh, Mexicans and uh, Native Americans uh, throughout the state. It, it included uh, the uh, this famous uh, 2nd Cavalry Regiment uh, headed by Alfred Sidney Johnson with Robert E. Lee, George Thomas, and, and many other prominent officers um, who would, who would uh, be um, uh, reach renown during the war. The Army had just over 16,000 men at this time, uh, 1,100 officers, one major general, and three brigadier generals, um, all of whom were at least 60 years old, as you reached rank only when uh, positions uh, became open by resignations or death. Um, the major general, of course, was Winfield Scott. The uh, three brigadier generals were John Wool of the Department of the East, uh, William Harney, uh, the Department of the West, and down in Texas, you had David Twiggs, this gentleman. Uh, Texas was particularly important in, as a secession occurred because having 20% of the U.S. Army, um, it was the one 
uh, department that might be able to provide immediate relief to the east um, by shipping men from the Texas coast uh, back uh, to the east coast or the Gulf Coast. Um, uh, an important factor about David Twiggs is he was thoroughly Southern. He was born in Georgia. And uh, as Texas began to, uh, to make efforts to secede, which was a bit messy because its governor, Sam Houston, staunchly opposed secession, uh, he announced that uh, he would uh, surrender his department with all of its men uh, to an old woman with a broom should she uh, show up uh, claiming the authority of uh, Texas. Um, uh, and so he did. And uh, in uh, mid-April, uh, he surrendered to a motley crew of uh, uh, Texas militia, more than perhaps an old woman with a broom. Um, they were supposed to uh, uh, be given a free passage from the coast uh, back to the United States. Um, however, um, when uh, Fort Sumter occurred, about a third of them were still in Texas and became the first POWs of the war. They were only allowed to take their sidearms with them and one light artillery battery. So uh, effectively, uh, Texas and its potential reinforcements to the east have been removed from the board. Uh, in the remaining um, the departments, only a few troops uh, in the de uh, Department of the West uh, will be uh, redeployed. And uh, Winfield Scott does his best to redeploy uh, units in the east to meet uh, the most uh, critical needs. Never, uh, never viewing uh, Harper's Ferry as a need, particularly because Abraham Lincoln uh, did not want to uh, take any action to either uh, abandon or, uh, or reinforce Harper's Ferry or Gosport under the fear that that might inflame tensions in Virginia and lead them to secede. So what, uh, what, can be done to defend Washington, D.C. Uh, in the early days of the war? Um, well, first, uh, let's look at mobilization in Washington itself. Winfield Scott um, had uh, mostly been uh, living in New York City uh, to stay away from John Floyd and uh, James Buchanan until December of 1860, when so concerned about uh, uh, Floyd's actions he relocated in early December back to Washington, D.C., um, where he did not like what he saw. Again, being a pro-Southern town with lots of militias forming, he was concerned that these might be pro-Southern militia. On uh, New Year's Day, a uh, former Army officer and friend of Winfield Scott's had uh, dinner with Winfield Scott as he happened to be in Washington, D.C., and this man was Charles Stone. Winfield Scott, uh, on the spot, offered Charles Stone a colonelcy to be the Inspector General of Washington with the uh, primary, with two tasks. One is to uh, identify and weed out any potential pro-Southern militia groups forming within Washington. And the other was to form as much of a pro-Union militia in Washington as could be had. Um, uh, Colonel Scott uh, went about this with efficiency, put uh, spies in all the existing militia units, discovered which ones would be disloyal, and had them disarmed. And by March the 4th, which was viewed as the critical date, with, because it was the day Lincoln was going to be inaugurated, uh, he had about three to 4,000 militiamen uh, on hand ready to uh, make sure that the inauguration went off without a hitch. As it did, uh, Scott and Stone uh, took a sigh of relief and the uh, militiamen um, were released um, from duty. When um, uh, secession, let's go back to uh, Colonel Stone, when uh, uh, it looked like uh, hostilities might commence over Fort Sumter on April the 10th, uh, Major Stone was told to uh, tried to get as many of his militiamen uh, as he could uh, to take an oath to defend the United States and its constitution. Um, in other words, to become a, a federal 
uh, volunteer soldiers instead of merely militiamen. Uh, by the night of April the 11th, uh, he had a few hundred uh, federalized militiamen. Uh, their duty was to, to report at night to guard certain key buildings in Washington, D.C., as well as the bridges across the Potomac and highways into Washington, D.C. Um, however, as uh, uh, Virginia seceded, uh, only a few hundred U.S. troops, uh, uh, Stone's volunteers, and a handful of Marines were to be found in Washington, D.C. There was concern about uh, the uh, safety of the White House. And so um, uh, Scott had Stone turn to a couple of irregular companies formed by these two men. The man on the left is new Senator uh, Jim, Jim Lane from Kansas, a veteran on the abolition side of bleeding Kansas uh, battles, uh, who had put together a company of 50 men. Um, Stone had them quartered inside the White House in the East Room on the nights of April 18 and April 19, with a, a company of 50 men formed by the man on the right, a, a prominent Kentucky named Cassius Clay, um, who was, uh, had received an appointment overseas but had uh, dallied in Washington, D.C. to see if he could be of assistance. Cassius Clay's company was the uh, reserve force for defense of the White House located in the Willard Hotel for uh, the, the nights of April 18 and 19. Uh, so few troops did uh, Willard's, uh, uh, did uh, Winfield Scott have to defend Washington, D.C. on those, those critical nights. Thus, um, as much as it could have been done locally in Washington, D.C. was done. Now we return to Lincoln's proclamation. The U.S. Army is largely uh, off the board in the East. Uh, local militia in D.C. have done what they could. He really needed uh, the uh, volunteers of uh, Northern militia. And this was his proclamation, which for Lincoln uh, was not a terribly uh, ringing proclamation. Um, starting out, whereas the laws of the United States have been and for some time past now are opposed and the execution obstructed in the states by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings or by the powers vested in the law, he is now calling forth the militia to um, um, suppress the combinations and to cause the laws to be executed. Why such stilted language from Abraham Lincoln? was because he was uncertain of his war powers. Congress was not in session. It would not be in session. It was not scheduled to be in session until December of 1861. Um, and the, the uh, strongest legal basis at this time that he could find uh, within which to act was the Militia Act of 1795. And his proclamation uh, directly quoted the Militia Act in terms of the uh, laws of the United States of uh, being opposed and the execution obstructed in any state by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, et cetera, et cetera. The Militia Act of 1795 uh, was created, uh, it uh, uh, revised a temporary Militia Act of 1792 in light of the Whiskey Rebellion. Critically, it mandated that the maximum amount of time any single man could be called into service under the act was three months within a 12 month period. And in 1799, it was further amended to limit the president to calling out no more than 75,000 men, which is um, exactly um, uh, the limits that uh, Lincoln's proclamation of April 15th, 75,000 men for three months. Uh, it was not uh, as has you know, often been suggested that Lincoln was, was uh, stupidly expecting um, that uh, three months, only 75,000 men working for three months would be sufficient to put down the rebellion. The same day then the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, put out a specific request to each of the states giving them quotas, uh, setting the size of a regiment at 780 men, 37 officers and 743 enlisted men, New York received a quota of 17 regiments, Pennsylvania 16, and Ohio 13. Three Union states received no requests, two on the West Coast in Kansas, which had just become a state in January. 
all of the uh, slave states that had not yet seceded received a request for at least one um, uh, regiment. Um, and this, of course, uh, uh, is what inflamed uh, each of those states, with the exception of Delaware, to strongly consider uh, seceding themselves. So now let's look at how uh, mobilization uh, uh, proceeded in some of the eastern states. Um, the first state to respond and send troops was uh, the closest non-slave state, and that's Pennsylvania. Um, Go Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania responded to um, Lincoln's proclamation by, by announcing that volunteers were already arriving, but they were unarmed. They had no ammunition. And uh, to, uh, for self-defense, he wanted to march them in large bodies. Uh, he had two Philadelphia reg reg regiments ready to go, and he's wondering if he should start to march them to Washington, D.C. Why did he so quickly have um, uh, men assembling? Uh, well, it's because of men like Henry Cake um, from Pottsville, Pennsylvania, which is a town about 50 miles north and east of Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania. Uh, Henry Cake had been financing a local militia company uh, for years, um, not to the extent of arming it, but, but to have a, a group of men able to um, march on appropriate holiday parades. Uh, like others, on Friday the 11th, the, uh, the sense, uh, I'm sorry, on Friday the 12th, um, uh, he had the sense that uh, the hostilities were about to break out. He hurried home, called a meeting of his militia, uh, which voted to offer its services to defend the D either Washington and the Union. Uncertain of who to inform this, they wired uh, both Harrisburg and uh, uh, Simon Cameron in Washington, D.C. The next day, it recruits men to fill out uh, the company from 40 to 100. And uh, on uh, Monday, uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, the people returned to their desks, both Harrisburg and Washington, D.C. accepted the offer after Lincoln's proclamation. So same day. Uh, that uh, Lincoln's proclamation, uh, you have a uh, company in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, that has organized itself. Uh, two days later, it and four other companies uh, are in Harrisburg. Uh, the next day, they take the oath to uh, serve the federal government and take a train to Washington, D.C. Now, when they board that train, this is the way the, uh, the uh, situation looked. Uh, Virginia is still they think, in the, uh, the Union. Um, Harrisburg is due north of Baltimore. Uh, it's connected with, to Baltimore by the uh, North Central Railroad, of which, by the way, Simon Cameron is a part owner. Um, so they board their train in Harrisburg um, for a short trip to Baltimore and from Baltimore to Washington, DC. Now, the thing about uh, train travel through Baltimore from the north at this time is whether you're coming from Harrisburg or Philadelphia, uh, you arrive at one train station in the uh, north part of Baltimore. You then have to march or be pulled through the streets of Baltimore for over a mile to get to the B&O train station on the south side of Baltimore and board B&O trains to, uh, to get to Washington, DC. This militia, had very few men in uniforms, More, most were in business suits or overalls, had a total of 34 muskets with no ammunition, uh, believed it was imperative to reach Washington, that it might be captured if, uh, if reinforcements weren't um, going to get there quickly. On the trip from Harrisburg to Baltimore, the uh, train engineer heard about potential trouble in Baltimore and stopped the train. Um, and was only uh, persuaded to continue on by threats of having the um, units um, uh, take over the train themselves and, and drive it into Baltimore. Luckily for the militia, um, there is a 40-man company of regular army troops also aboard the same train that were being sent to Fort McHenry, which at this time was practically undefended. When they did get to Baltimore, the rumors of trouble were true. There was an angry pro-Southern mob. Um, however, as these troops uh, uh, 
made their way through Baltimore. Um, they were escorted by the uh, company of regulars. Uh, also, one of the uh, other companies uh, happened to have coveralls uh, or overcoats and sabers, and so they looked like they might be regulars. And so it was enough of a uh, show of force to, uh, for the most part, prevent violence against uh, these uh, uh, militiamen. However, not completely. One, uh, one man had, was injured when a brick was dropped on his head um, from above. And a black man in uniform named Nicholas Biddle, who was not a militiaman, but a valet for an officer, um, was rushed at and struck in his forehead by a man who was wearing uh, uh, brass knuckles. Uh, Nicholas Biddle wanted to retaliate, but the uh, orders the officers had given all of the men uh, was to do nothing provocative while they were transiting through Baltimore because it was extremely important that they reach Washington, D.C., and uh, they couldn't let any abuse, and they were taking a lot of abuse in terms of being shouted at, jeered, and sped upon, stop them. So they get through Baltimore. Um, they arrive in uh, Washington, D.C. on the 18th of April. Um, the uh, first uh, militiamen to, to get to Washington, D.C., but they are unarmed. Uh, they've barely been uh, accounted for. They are met at the station by Major Irwin McDowell, who uh, escorts them to the House of Representatives as their bivouac, but nobody has thought to provide them any food. Uh, we'll return to two other regiments from Philadelphia in a moment, but in the meantime, let's look at New York, which had the uh, largest um, uh, quota of regiments. Of particular note in New York was the uh, 7th New York uh, Militia Regiment. Um, it was uh, nearly 50 years old, 60 years old. Um, it was formed entirely in New York City. It was uh, uh, provide, it, its members were wealthy and middle class members for the most part. It was very well equipped. It was very well privately financed. Uh, rival regiments called it the uh, Silk Stocking Regiment. They called themselves the National Guard. And in fact, uh, that name from this unit would be uh, given to all National Guard troops when uh, the Militia Act was um, uh, reformed in 1862. Not only did it have a full complement of 1,000 men, it also had a 44-man band. And perhaps the only regiment in the country, it drilled regularly as a regiment. Uh, even Army regular, regular Army units did not drill this way as they were scattered about as single companies here, there, and elsewhere. Scott, who had lived in New York, knew it very well. It knew its leaders, uh, particularly its Colonel Marshall Leffitts, quite well. And in January, they had offered their services directly to um, to Major General Scott. So uh, on Monday, April 15th, after Lincoln's proclamation and Cameron's um, follow-up uh, communication, uh, Scott wired the governor of New York specifically asking for the 7th New York militia to be sent. Um, the day it boarded its trains on the 19th in the morning, this was the situation that that uh, it looked at. It knew Virginia had seceded. It knew Harper's Ferry had been overrun. But it boarded trains uh, in New Jersey uh, to go through Philadelphia and Baltimore to get to Washington, DC. However, uh, by the time it got to Philadelphia in the early morning hours, news had come of the riot in Baltimore on the 19th. Why was it so slow getting out of New York so that it couldn't get through Baltimore? Well, um, some of its members decided it could not uh, leave New York for uh, 90 days. They dropped out and the uh, militia wanted to, uh, wanted to have replacements. Um, and it took from um, Monday the 15th until uh, Friday the 19th for it to feel like it was ready to, to depart. Uh, it was upset because a couple of Massachusetts regiments had already come through town ahead of it on its way to Washington, D.C. Um, so it boarded a train uh, with its full complement of men, a 44-man band, and its own um, artillery in the form of two howitzers complete with ammunition. 
as uh, we saw when it reached Philadelphia, it learned that Baltimore was essentially closed. Um, it was given a couple of options. The head of the uh, Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad suggested that uh, they stay on the railroad until they got to Perryville, um, Maryland, where a ferry ship called the Maryland uh, was used by the railroad to take uh, the uh, uh, cars across the uh, head of the Susquehanna River to uh, Havre de Grasse, de Grace. And then from there, the Maryland could ship it down to, uh, to Annapolis. Um, however, the officers of the 7th who tried to reach Washington but couldn't since all of the um, telegraph lines had been cut, uh, consulted and decided that would be a dangerous course of action if the um, pro-Southern uh, uh, men of Maryland were rioting in Baltimore and burning uh, bridges, why wouldn't they also seize the uh, Maryland ferry, the, the ferry called the Maryland, and uh, prevent anybody from using it, whereupon these, uh, these troops would be stuck uh, in Maryland with no way to get to Washington. So the uh, Colonel Leffert used his own firm's money to hire a ship to take his entire regiment with its band and its howitzers to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, he also um, had his brother buy provisions for the regiment with his own money and told his brother to arrange for the provisions to meet them in Washington, D.C. Um, so they sailed, they sailed off. Um, as they got near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, they heard that Gosport had been taken. They assumed that uh, Washington, D.C. was, um, and the Potomac River was blocked, and therefore they ended up uh, deciding to go to Annapolis anyway. And we'll return to them in a little while. So as they head off they, and they get to the mouth of the Chesapeake, uh, they learn perhaps the only way they can get to Washington is through Annapolis which suddenly uh, has become a uh, strategically important city in the United States, as well as the capital of Maryland and the home of the uh, US Naval Academy. So now then we turn to the uh, third and last of the states that we're gonna talk about today in terms of mobilization, and that's Massachusetts. The Massachusetts militia was in an interesting position <coughs> thanks to a change of party control of the state of Massachusetts in the elections of 1860. Uh, early in January, Governor John Andrew uh, was sworn in as a Republican, replacing a, uh, the prior governor, a man named Nathaniel Banks, who was a Democrat, who had reorganized the state militia in 860 and placed it under uh, Brigadier General uh, Benjamin Butler. Uh, it was viewed uh, by John Andrew and the Republicans as an extension of the state Democratic Party, which in large part it was being formed uh, largely from blue collar men uh, around the state. Uh, when Benjamin Butler went to Andrew in the early part of January uh, to, to talk about getting the militia ready uh, in case the uh, more states seceded and the militia was called upon, uh, he did not, uh, Governor Andrews did not trust uh, Benjamin Butler, um, did not trust the uh, militia and wanted assurances that uh, the Democrats in the militia would in fact support a, a federal government headed by uh, a Republican, Abraham Lincoln, and also that every man in every company would be willing uh, and able to uh, leave his job and family on a, a minute's notice um, and, and had all out of state. Uh, Butler set about this with his usual intelligence and energy. And by early February, Massachusetts actually alone of all the states in the North had an up-to-date record of uh, uh, militiamen uh, who would be able to respond to a call from Washington. Um, Butler then said, we need to equip these men. Um, Andrews went to uh, the uh, the uh, state legislature got some emergency appropriations, um, and uh, by the end of February, all the militiamen had new overcoats. Um, the 
the equipment itself had not yet uh, come in, but when Lincoln's um, inauguration passed without a problem, uh, the legislature canceled the rest of the emergency appropriations and uh, on April the 11th uh, adjourned itself. Um, however, uh, Governor Andrews, um, this is our hero, Benjamin uh, Butler, um, who had wanted to go to West Point, uh, but he was too sickly. He became a trial lawyer. Um, he fought uh, mill owners, yet nonetheless still became wealthy in Lowell, uh, entered state politics, and strangely enough, was Jefferson Davis's most loyal supporter in the 1860 Democratic Conventions. Governor Andrews had, um, in response, uh, sent the short note uh, uh, to, uh, to Washington that uh, dispatchers received by what route should they send them in. Governor Andrews had also um, asked uh, for permission to get 2,000 modern rifles out of the Springfield Armory and Arsenal so that he could equip two regiments to, uh, to staff two of the abandoned ports in Boston Harbor. He got the uh, weapons, but they were uh, distributed to the four militia companies that uh, Benjamin Butler had called out. Now, what had Benjamin Butler done? On April the 15th, the day of Lincoln's proclamation, at 4.45 p.m., he was arguing a case in a courtroom in Boston. When he got a note about the proclamation, he immediately asked the judge uh, for uh, a continuance of the case, rushed to a train station and caught the five o'clock train back to his home in Lowell, Massachusetts. Butler was no longer uh, in charge of the Massachusetts uh, militia, but he was still in charge of a brigade of four regiments. He got to Lowell and that evening got his uh, regiments uh, preparing to um, uh, uh, depart Massachusetts in response to the proclamation. Morning of April 16th, uh, Butler then uh, catches a train and hurries back to Boston. Um, uh, he arrives in Governor Andrews' office and asks for command of the uh, uh, brigade that is going to be sent out of Massachusetts. Um, Andrews, who still doesn't like or trust Butler, had uh, two other officers in mind that he preferred, one of whom he had called into his office to offer him the command of the brigade. However, when Butler walks out of Andrew's office, he has received the um, uh, appointment as the Massachusetts general in charge of the uh, brigade that's responding to Lincoln's call for men. Why would John Andrews um, reverse himself in that one short meeting? The answer is financing uh, of uh, the response to, to Lincoln. There was, of course, no federal money. Congress was not in session. Um, and this is all going to have to be financed at the uh, state or private level. And as we've seen, the 7th New York was entirely privately financed. Well, the Massachusetts legis legislature had adjourned on April the 11th after canceling the emer emergency appropriations. On uh, the morning of April 16th, as Governor Andrews was busily trying to get his regiments off to Washington, D.C., because he also had the sense that uh, uh, time was critical to save Washington. The uh, state treasurer informed Andrews that Massachusetts had no funds to, uh, to send militia units out of state. The uh, legislature would have to be recalled and would have to appropriate funds, which would be a critical delay of several days at best. On the train trip from Lowell to Boston, uh, General Butler happened to see a Boston banker. And having been a, a politician in Massachusetts, uh, had anticipated that financing was going to be a problem and that the state was going to need a bridge loan. Uh, Butler asked the banker, James Carney, if he and his bank would be willing to provide a bridge loan to Massachusetts so that no time would be lost in getting uh, troops on their way. They arrive in Boston. They go to Carney's office. Uh, Carney prepares the loan uh, along with uh, other banks. Uh, and um, writes down the offer of a bridge loan for Butler to carry with him to uh, Governor Andrews. And in the same letter also uh, happens to recommend that uh, Butler be given 
the command of the troops. Uh, Butler shows up in Andrew's office. Andrew's had this problem. Butler has a solution. And uh, voila, uh, Butler now becomes the Brigadier General uh, in charge of the four regiments that are in his brigade that uh, he has already got in motion to come to Boston and uh, to report to Washington, D.C. So on the next day, um, the 17th, uh, again, this is how the uh, situation looked to the men in Boston. Virginia's still in the country and um, the, the rail line is still open to Washington, D.C. However, um, the first two regiments uh, are not going to go to Washington, D.C. because General Scott uh, says we need them in Fort Monroe. And so on the 17th of April, the 4th Massachusetts ships out and on the 18th of April, the 3rd Massachusetts ships out to Fort Monroe. It's a two-day trip and they arrive on the 19th and 20th respectively. Um, the 3rd Massachusetts is immediately uh, uh, sent along with 50 to 100 Marines that have just arrived from the Washington Navy Yard uh, in a uh, vain effort to save uh, Gosport Navy Yard. They are just a few hours too late. Uh, the uh, com uh, commandant in charge of the Gosport Navy Yard uh, had uh, already decided that he was facing too, too many militiamen, um, uh, Virginia militiamen, and all he could do was try to destroy what he could before abandoning the Navy Yard. He sank um, uh, unmanned Navy ships uh, including the uh, Merrimack, uh, tried to blow up the dry dock that didn't work, tried to uh, uh, destroy cannons, that was, that was undone. And so uh, the third Massachusetts and the uh, Marines are just too late, Gosport is abandoned, uh, but they ha are in Fort Monroe. And Fort Monroe is now viewed as being uh, too serious of a uh, target, uh, too well defended for uh, Virginia to try to overrun Fort Monroe. So back in Boston, you have the 6th and the 8th Massachusetts regiments. Um, and uh, uh, the 6th sets out on the same day, the 17th, by rail. It has 700 or so men, all equipped, well not, yes, all equipped with new rifles from the arsenal that uh, Governor Andrews had requested. Passed through New York City uh, on the 18th. Um, uh, this is the uh, day that uh, the uh, Pennsylvania troops are going through Baltimore and facing some difficulty. On the 19th, it passes through Baltimore, uh, is attacked. Uh, a handful of men are killed. 40 are wounded. It kills uh, several rioting civilians. Um, it does manage to get through Washington, D.C., uh, thanks to the fact it's well armed. And uh, so you now have one Massachusetts armed regiment in Washington, D.C., along with the unarmed five companies from Pennsylvania. But now um, Baltimore is closed. Two regiments comprising a total of 10 companies were on the same train with uh, the 6th Massachusetts. Um, these are untrained and unequipped uh, Pennsylvania militia. Uh, they're sitting in the in their half of the train in the north part of Baltimore as the riots occur uh, uh, that uh, attack the 6th uh, Massachusetts. Eventually, the mobs discover these men and begin to attack them. Um, uh, one man by name is known to have been killed while sitting in the train. Um, the rest of the men get out and flee. Um, uh, the Baltimore police do their best to, to round them up, protect them, and get them on a train out of town. Uh, however, um, about 28 of them, 28 of them march out of town, uh, uh, and a few miles north of Baltimore are surrounded by militia, jailed, and threatened be, with being lynched um, before uh, it was finally decided they could be marched out of the state, accompanied by the militia. Um, which taunt them all the way to the uh, Pennsylvania border. So Baltimore is closed. That's, that night is when it's decided to uh, tear down the uh, lines, burn the railroads, and nobody else is getting to Washington, D.C. from the north by railroad. Um, 
So this is the situation, the eighth Massachusetts, uh, which left um, Boston the day after the sixth Massachusetts is facing when it gets to Philadelphia. Um, the president of the uh, Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad gives Benjamin Butler, who is traveling with the eighth Massachusetts, the same uh, option that he had given that he will shortly also give the seventh New York, which is to take the train down to Perryville uh, at the Susquehanna, which is right here, uh, and board the Maryland and have the Maryland transport it down the Chesapeake Bay to Annapolis. Uh, Benjamin Butler uh, takes him up on the offer, tries to get uh, Lefferts and the uh, 7th New Jersey to uh, come with them. In fact, tries to pull rank on Lefferts saying, I'm a, a general, you're a colonel, you must obey. And Lefferts replies, uh, you're a general in Massachusetts. You are not a general in New York and I am not obeying you. This was the, uh, the riot that the men of the 6th Massachusetts faced. So the 8th Massachusetts has nine companies armed with Springfield rifles and 10 cartridges of ammunition, ammunition apiece. <clears throat> One company does not have rifles, but it has axes. This is a company of seamen. Um, they take the train to Perryville on April the 21st, and they arrive in Annapolis on the 22nd, where uh, Governor Hicks, who is a, uh, in theory, pro-union, but basically is, is, is swaying with whatever way the winds are going, he tells the troops to go somewhere else, that they'll just make things worse. Meanwhile, the uh, uh, commandant at the uh, Naval Academy uh, uh, begs um, uh, Butler to save Old Ironsides. He's afraid that the uh, Naval Academy in Old Ironsides, which has still got cannon, is about to be overrun by local Southern men in Annapolis. The Marblehead Company, which is a bunch of seamen, uh, sails uh, Old Ironsides away from the Academy out into safety in the bay. And um, eventually, uh, after a mishap of being stuck in the mud, uh, the 8th Massachusetts lands in Annapolis um, right after the 7th New York landed in Annapolis. Um, Butler again tries to pull rank on Lefferts. Lefferts says it's a 30 mile hike across country from Annapolis to Washington and uh, I want to, to hike my men that way, even though I'm lugging two pieces of artillery with me. Butler says, we should uh, take what is now suddenly the most important rail in America, the 14 mile rail line from Annapolis to Annapolis Junction on the B&O. We should march out by uh, and follow the rail tracks uh, and repair it and get the railroad in running order um, so that uh, uh, we can uh, have a rail link to Washington, D.C. Uh, back in Washington, D.C., Major General Scott is having exactly the same idea. And he sends out eight couriers to go cross country by different routes to get to Annapolis to, uh, to tell the, uh, the uh, troops that are landing in Annapolis uh, that he would like them, if at all possible, to secure the rail line and repair it. Uh, six of the eight uh, don't get through, uh, are either captured or turned back to Washington, D.C. Two men uh, come in bearing the same message, uh, and so Lefferts agrees to cooperate with Benjamin Butler. <clears throat> and now uh, the question becomes, how can they get the, uh, the rail line, uh, the Annapolis rail line, up and running? Butler goes to the train station, <clears throat> Ask the uh, ask the uh, railmen there. Um, are there any uh, engines? Now this rail line has a total of one engine, um, but uh, Butler is told no, no, we have no engines. Um, Butler, looking around, uh, uh, pokes his head into some building, comes across one that's locked, and says, "What's in this building?" And he's told, "Oh, there's there's nothing in it." Butler uh, doesn't believe him. He has his men. Um, break the uh, the building open and there is the train. Unfortunately, 
the uh, the train has been uh, rendered unusable. The the engine's been rendered unusable by having key parts removed. Fortunately, uh, Butler's men find those key parts lying close by instead of carried off. Uh, uh, and best of all, when Butler turns around and asks his uh, 8th Massachusetts Regiment, does anybody know how to uh, operate and fix a train? Uh, one man steps forward and says, uh, a private home man steps forward and says, well, I think I can because I helped build this particular engine. And sure enough, uh, private Homan's uh, initials are found scratched on the engine. Uh, he gets the train in repair. Um, Butler asks his regiment, does anybody know how to lay tracks? Because the tracks are being torn up uh, between Annapolis and Annapolis Junction. Uh, he's got 20 men who can lay tracks. And so he takes two of his companies and two of Lefford's companies, and they start up the, uh, the rail line um, hunting for uh, rails. Um, when uh, the uh, pro-Southern Maryland men uh, removed the rails, sometimes they just threw them to the side uh, and like the train parts, quickly found, brought back, and put back in place. Sometimes um, uh, they carried the, the rails off in a wagon. Uh, however, luckily there were found some sidings along the, the uh, tracks and so rails from the sidings were used as replacements for the rails that had been carted off. And as this picture shows, uh, sometimes uh, they threw it over the one bridge uh, that the, uh, the train went over. In fact, the bridge was burnt uh, and so Butler's uh, handy men um, were able to uh, repair the bridge. And eventually they get to Annapolis Junction. Um, the uh, 7th New York is entirely intact at Annapolis Junction, only part of the 8th Massachusetts. Meanwhile, back in Washington, uh, on the 24th, uh, Scott has done something similar. He has sent uh, militiamen to the train station to take possession of the uh, two engines there, the rolling stock and uh, on the 24th had sent a train up the line to Annapolis Junction hoping to find uh, a regiment waiting, uh, but no regiments were there yet. The train returned to Washington, D.C. Uh, reports are coming in about thousands of men gathering in Alexandria, uh, about all the men up in Harper's Ferry who are only a two or three hour train ride away, uh, and Scott is expecting Washington to be attacked at any moment. Uh, that morning, uh, when the uh, train from D.C. is sent up the tracks, um, the 7th New York is present, it boards the train, and it arrives in Washington, D.C. Great jubilation in Washington, D.C. You now have a fully equipped um, regiment uh, in town uh, to supplement the uh, 6th uh, Massachusetts um, and the uh, five companies of Pennsylvania. Uh, plus you now have a open rail line between uh, Annapolis and Washington DC. The 8th from Massachusetts will arrive on the 26th uh, without provisions, but uh, the rich provisions that had been uh, bought for the 7th New York or uh, 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 feed the 8th uh, uh, Massachusetts as well. Uh, Benjamin Butler does not go to uh, Washington, D.C., because he is the highest ranking officer if he stays in Annapolis, whereas he will not be if he's in Washington, D.C. Also, uh, regiments are starting to uh, arrive in Annapolis um, and need to be forwarded to Washington, D.C. In fact, uh, three more New York regiments are in Annapolis, and one regiment of 544 men has arrived from Rhode Island uh, with the governor of Rhode Island, uh, Governor Sprague, in personal command, because uh, he has financed this particular regiment. Uh, Winfield Scott creates a uh, army department, the Department of Annapolis, and places Butler in command. Um, Butler actually uh, does a fine job, and in fact, in May, uh, gets tired of what's going on in Baltimore, decides to restore uh, a rail connection through Baltimore, uh, from Washington, D.C. to the north, and without uh, consulting with Winfield Scott, takes a regiment, enters Baltimore in a rainstorm in the middle of the night, and now uh, Baltimore is under Union control. 
Lincoln and Scott are very unhappy about this at first. Uh, Lincoln is trying to uh, do his best to keep uh, Maryland from uh, uh, seceding uh, and um, uh, is afraid that Butler's uh, unauthorized action will, uh, will create problems. Um, Winfield Scott, of course, knows that uh, Butler has uh, operated without orders. Lincoln tells Scott to give Butler a written reprimand. Butler uh, is unhappy with this, goes to Washington, D.C., meets with Lincoln, uh, and in the end, Lincoln promotes Butler to a major general uh, uh, in the uh, Union Army and sends him off to command the uh, Department of Virginia, which essentially at this time is uh, consisting of uh, Fort Monroe. So uh, the first wave of um, mobilization in the North has been just enough to save Washington, D.C. Uh, had it remained uh, sitting pretty defenseless much longer, uh, the temptation of uh, uh, the Virginians and the Confederacy to go ahead and grab it might have turned out to be too much. Um, some epilogues, uh, John Floyd, uh, the former Secretary of War, became a major general in the Confederate Army, um, where he was in command at uh, uh, Donaldson and decided that the risk that he would be hung as a traitor was too high, and so uh, he turned Donaldson over uh, to uh, Gideon Pillow before departing when it was going to surrender to Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, David Twigg, the day, you know, moments after surrendering uh, San Antonio and the Department of Texas, immediately left for New Orleans where he became a major general, uh, one of the highest ranking generals in the South at the time, <clears throat> before resigning for ill health and dying in 1862. Henry Wise, who um, essentially created a coup under uh, Governor Fletcher of Virginia, uh, became a brigadier general in the uh, Confederate Army, uh, did some poor service, some good service, and was uh, one of the men who surrendered at Appomattox. The uh, two partial regiments of Philadelphia, uh, from Philadelphia, that uh, were turned back uh, on April 19th uh, and unable to reach Washington, D.C., went back, uh, reorganized themselves, filled themselves out, and uh, uh, became the 26th and 27th uh, uh, regiments out of Pennsylvania as three-year regiments. Uh, Benjamin Butler, of course, uh, we all know, uh, ended up uh, being a high-ranking general throughout the war. Not particularly good uh, as a, a military general. Um, however, uh, he was the one who came up with the idea that uh, escaped slaves should be retained as, quote, contraband under the laws of war, um, which solved a, uh, a difficult problem that Lincoln was already having in May of 1861. He also did a good job of pacifying New Orleans after New Orleans was captured. Um, and finally, um, uh, Major General Winfield Scott was uh, pretty unceremoniously pushed aside um, by uh, McClellan uh, just months later, uh, where uh, he went off in retirement. And lastly, uh, Charles Stone became a, uh, a general uh, in charge of a division that happened to unfortunately have uh, Senator Baker uh, as a colonel in one of its regiments, and Senator Baker got himself killed at Ball's Bluff, and uh, Charles Stone was held as the uh, scapegoat, um, uh, arrested, never charged, held in solitary confinement uh, in um, Boston Harbor for a period of six months uh, before finally uh, uh, being released, but never again having any kind of a command, even though Twice, he was uh, requested to serve as a chief of staff of uh, uh, Army generals. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, I have no books uh, to sell, um, but if you're interested in a, a speaker on this topic or other topics uh, related to mobilization or on the uh, second Wisconsin, uh, please contact me at my email address here. And if you wish to read more about the uh, topic of today, um, here's a list of uh, four uh, really excellent books um, that I would recommend.
Uh, and then there is a, a third book by David Detzer called Donnybrook, which uh, covers the Battle of First Bull Run and kind of completes a trilogy he wrote of uh, significant events in 1861 at the outbreak of the war. Again, thank you very much.